I'm very pleased to, um, to introduce the, the, the final memorial lecture of, of the conference. This is the Murray N. Rothbard Memorial Lecture, sponsored by Don Prince, who is present here uh, for the weekend. Uh, the speaker, Professor David Doerr, is a Swiss citizen and a law professor uh, for uh, emeritus for private law and theory of law at the University of Zurich. He's also a practicing lawyer, mainly in business-oriented matters. In 1971, Professor Dewar began law studies at the universities of Basel and Geneva, and then went on to receive his doctorate and bar admission in Switzerland. He completed his studies with a Master of Laws at Harvard Law School in 1979. Later, he wrote his habilitation thesis at the University of Zurich, where he then served as a professor of law for around 25 years. Besides his doctoral thesis in private law and his habilitation thesis in theory of law, Dr. Dewar wrote scientific commentaries in private law matters and numerous articles on private law methodology, jurisprudence, and philosophy of law, including libertarian subjects such as law without a state. He gives regular lectures and speeches with libertarian organizations such as Mises Institute Germany, Hayek Clubs in Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, and the Property and Freedom Society in Bodrum, among others. Professor Dewar will address us now on the inescapability of law and of Mises, Rothbard, and Hoppe. Thanks very much, um, Joe, for this introduction. And first of all, thanks very much for the uh, honoring invitation to have this lecture here, and namely the Murray Rothbard lecture, um, which was really a, a pleasure for me when you asked me whether I could uh, have this lecture here, this Murray Rothbard lecture. When you invited me in your friendly letter, you said perhaps the conference could be interest, interested to hear something um, on how you came to develop your novel anarchistic arguments against the classical liberal and social democratic conceptions of the state, which parallel but are not based on the views of Mary Rothbard and Hans Hermann Hoppe. Um, this is in a way astonishing, perhaps. Indeed, I am not a long-time participant of this conference or of these organizations. It's relatively late that I, that I got in contact with you and your way of thinking. But in a moment when I realized there is a group, there is a movement that is precisely, or let's say that, very close to what I thought also. So um, I, I am invited to tell you about how I came to this conclusion. Um, the short answer would be because it's inescapable. <laughs> I give you now an answer a bit more extensive, how I came to this inescapable result. Actually, at the beginning, there was not something like, it's wrong with the state or so, or property rights should be more supported. At the beginning was a completely different question that, that interested me very much. It is, what is law? Quite simple. When I began to study law, I chose that subject. I do not know why precisely, but I was interested to learn what it is, what is law. The first answers in the basic studies were quite disappointing. I did not hear something about what law is. What I heard is what is in this statute or in that statute or in that precedent but not what is law. I mean, if you choose medicine, then it's much easier to imagine something, but law is something quite abstract. So no answers at this very first stage. Um, no importance of this question when I 
made my professional exams, bar exam, for instance, there too you just learn your, your handwork, so to speak, but, but not what is this phenomenon. Maybe at that time you do not have enough ex possibility to have or opportunities to have experience with it. Then I came a bit closer to that question with interesting comparisons between our continental um, system of codified law on the one hand and your tradition, so to speak, the US and English tradition of the common law. Um, an opportunity I had to compare these two systems when I spent the year at Harvard Law School. Um, my habilitation thesis then, some years later, uh, brought me even more close to uh, this question. I wanted to know what about um, sources of law beyond state-made statutes. In our traditions, the statutes, the um, state-made statutes are the most prominent source of law. Um, but what about cases, maybe generally debated conflicts that have no answer in the statutes? Um, what, where do you get answers from if you want to decide such over-individual conflicts? This is what I was interested in. Um, what does the law say if there is no state legislation or maybe according to your system, if there are no specific precedents, typically in such over-individual conflicts, that brought me even nearer to that question of what is law. I still was not an anarchist at that time. Now, if you look at such conflicts, very general conflicts, conflicts you have no precedence for it, no statutory answer, then um, um, you are somehow, um, you, you, you have not very much help. Um, at the very least, you can say law is something that comes up as a relevant subject in case of a conflict taking place. So what is law? Uh, this is something, some phenomenon, phenomenon that, that appears under certain situation. It's not something which is just there as some absolute entity, some norm, but something, some questions, some need that comes up if there is a conflict. Law, that, that's another aspect of this, is sort of a side effect of a movement, of, of a change. It's a function of of something which is happening. Um, it's a dynamic uh, phenomenon. It's, it's not static. It's a correction of what happens or what happened and not a correction of what is. And furthermore, law depends on being articulated. Uh, on being articulated within a conflict of interest that um, become incompatible. It is law is something that comes up loud in a way. Um, it's not, um, this belongs to the dynamic of this aspect. Um, it comes up and is articulated. There are arguments, there is, there is may crying, whatever, of conflict. Um, there are subjects behind that formulate them. These are elements, not yet very much helpful, may, may, but, but, but nevertheless, that, that could, could help to, to go further. Now, within this context, parties are relevant only as far as they collide with each other. This, this is sort of entry to what you all know, and what also in our tradition is well known, of this aspect of equality before the law. Um, if, if you have just a conflict, you have just the parties that collide with each other, um, um, they collide mutually. There is a, a identical reciprocity. 
And uh, this says that the two parties, there is no party that is of more value than the other. They just collide and only as far as they, they, they collide with each other, you have the relevant criterions to deal with that case, which is something like equality before the law. Then only as far as their collision is in contrast to their subjectivity, you have to deal with law. So this means that um, um, this has to do with that articulation I mentioned before. Um, this gives you the criterion. In Latin, you, you know this, this Roman parami, volenti non fit in Uria, the one who wants something does not um, is not injured, um, or the principle of consent. As long as there is a content between the conflicting party, there is no need for the law to influence the case. And something that can also be drawn out of this pure conflict element, that pre-existing positions are stronger than the later ones. Maybe this then could lead to the aspect of property, what you already have, your body, your uh, belongings, um, is first to you, to use subjectivity, and, and, and only then comes the other one. So this gives uh, a priority of priority of property rights, and this supports also the uh, non-aggression principle. So just out of this conflict, we come of these conflicts of the ground anatomy of a conflict, you come to criterions that are quite there, where you know in the traditions um, of our um, legal uh, systems. All these principles are developed out of the conflicts themselves. Um, historically, also, one could say that quite a lot or almost all of our legal tradition, our common legal tradition, not just the European one, the um, American one uh, as well, come out of court cases primarily. Uh, the ancient Roman law, as you know, is primarily a court-made uh, law. Even the famous corpus Iuris Justiniani um, it was not, or the main part of it was not state legislation. It was a collection of uh, long-term traditions of court decisions, private law in general. Even in our continental system where we have this codification um, uh, principle, um, there too, at least until mid-19th uh, century, um, that was, was court-made law. And the codes, by the way, the codes made in the 19th or beginning 20th century were kind of restatements, uh, as you call it, as you, you, you know it, restatements of the law developed uh, in, in practical uh, court cases. This is interesting now. Um, if you develop these principles, these generally well-known principles just out of the conflicts. So I, I developed these ideas not, or I found these answers not in, in specific precedents, not, not in, in, in statutory provisions, um, not in other external sources, but just in the conflict itself. The conflict itself gave answers how to solve um, to solve it. Oh, that's interesting. So, in order to solve conflicts, you do not need a state legislator. So, the law, or what, what I describe as law, is already there. It comes out of the conflict. So, this is nice. And now, this, this brought me already a bit in the neighborhood of anarchism. State is not needed. I did not say yet the state is illegitimate. That comes later. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But at first, it's not needed. It's, it's already something, at least for our continental tradition, it's already something, um, because we, the first we do is to, to, to take the text, the, the, the law book, the statute in the collection. It's not just one book, unfortunately. It's a whole shelf of books. Um, and then you look, what, what did the state say to this question? Um, but that, that was an interesting um, uh, uh, notice that it's not necessary to have it. But nevertheless, at that stage, maybe it's still useful to have it. Um, maybe it's useful to have some strong instance that that you know um, regulates this regulates these norms that are there. We admit that, but somebody should look for it. And as long as the state uh, does himself respect these rules we just draw drew out of the conflicts themselves, as long as as he respects it, uh, then it's okay. But that, that led then to the next question, does he respect these principles? These principles we, we found before, equality before the law, consent, things like that. So let's have a look at it. Equality of the law, rule of the law, does the state, that, that was my next question, does the state respect or follow these principles. In theory, it does. We have this lex rex. Um, um, sl uh, how shall I say? Slogan um, uh, formulated in the Enlightenment. Um, Samuel Rutherford, um, who developed an uh, interesting um, way of thinking that monarchy is not blamed as such, is not um, criti uh, criticized as such, but the, the king should follow the law. It's, it's okay to have a king, it's, it's even justified to have a king, but he has to follow the law. He must be under the law. So not any more rex lex, but the other way around, lex rex. To say this was very dangerous at that time for Rutherford. It brought him an accusation of, of, uh, of, of high treason, and he escaped death penalty only by the fact that he died of old age. But the king did not agree with that, of course. But but the theory was was uh, quite um, became quite well known, and I, I think this the slogan is is quite good. Uh, Lex Rex. This is is really you, you can keep that. Um, so this theory, and this of course is the theory of of um, of the rule of law. Um, that. The state, even the state with his power and with everything, with his right to enforce um, his, his judgments, his decisions, even the state is under the law. He has to follow the law. Now comes, comes something uh, very uh, astonishing. It's the state himself as source of law who makes the law. I mean, this is a joke, actually. Um, if you say the state now, or the king, the state, uh, just this, this monopolistic authority must be, since enlightenment, must be under the law. Okay, that's a good principle. Who makes the law? The king. Th th this, this is a joke, actually, but, but, but it's reality. It's, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not only a joke. It, it's a joke, but it's reality, too. And, and this is what, what we have in everyday life of our state, it's the very state who makes the laws to control him. Now, um, not surprisingly, what he, what he then makes with these laws, with these statutes, with these decrees, whatever, um, when it's about this principle of equality before the law, um, what he makes, this is very, very, uh, very obvious in our system, maybe 
in, in the common law system, it, it's, it's not yet that clear. Um, but in our system, at the least, he makes now, through his legislation, through his statutes, to completely categorically different areas of law. There is the private law on the one hand and the public law on the other hand. Private law, this is for normal people like you and me, or like, like, like private enterprises. And public law, this is for whom? For the state, for himself. And this public law, you learn that in the law courses, in our tradition, you learn that in the very first lessons, lesson, you know, there are two kinds of law. We have private law, and we have public law, and all students learn that, and um, it, it's a first category, but actually it's a, it's a scandal. It's, it's the institutionalized um, um, offense against this principle of equality before the law. A breach of this principle by the, the, the very fundamental structure of our system of law. With a lot of examples I can give you there. And then the next um, element of the rule of law, um, separation of power, this belongs to, this, to, the, to these, these items um, of, of uh, the rule of law, separation of power. This is something strange, really. This also, you, you can call it a joke. Separation of power means there are separate powers. Um, traditionally, you distinguish between the legislative power, the exec executive power, and the um, judicial power. So separation means separation. That these are three, three organizations. Maybe you can imagine 20 organizations, but let's be happy with three. Um, three organizations. Now, um, are there three organizations? There is one. Um, the notion branch of government. There are three branches of government. Three branches of the very same tree. So there is one tree. Um, <laughs> actually, it's not separation of power. It's concentration of power. This is reality. All, all you learn about constitutional structures, maybe in your country it's, it's, it's traditionally more separated. I, I could imagine. Um, you, you shake the head. No, it's not. not. Um, actually, in, in our tradition, this is that they, have, they are at the same uh, the telephone, um, you know, central. They all have the same telephone numbers. The first, no, not the extension here, and maybe maybe some some coffee some coffee break uh, rooms are, are for both. Of them. <laughs> Switzerland is all very very, very small, you know. But uh, this problem of concentration of power instead of separation of power, you have that. And very in a very very clear sense. So um, we do not have to time to go in, in all details, but, but um, this test, when we are now trying to find out whether this organization is legitimate to play a certain role in the system of, of law, then one must say this test is not fulfilled. Now what about the next principle? The principle of consent we developed right before um, out of the conflict, um, this direct the, the, the concept which which is closely linked with the principle of democracy. We, we heard a lot already about democracy um, in these uh, speeches and lectures now in this conference uh, about this um, ideology of democracy, things like that, and now from a really legal point of view that the question I had, um, this organization, um, does this function according to the will of all people in this country? Um, 
you, you can check that. You, you can make a chart and then say, okay, now let's see um, what is a perfect democracy. A perfect democracy, according to the notion, is dem demos, krati. Um, it, it's it's the, the people who, who governs itself. Um, so the perfect democracy, of course, that would not be realistic. The perfect is all legislation, all norms are accepted by all people. That would be perfect. Of course, not realistic. Let's be generous and say maybe, maybe it's a bit less, maybe it's 51% or something like that. Um, but now, how is it? Is it really? And how is it really in Switzerland? Because um, one of the as, as, astonished questions sometimes I, I hear is, but you come from Switzerland. What do you have against the state? Um, and, and you criticize Switzerland as well. I mean, Switzerland, this is the paradise of democracy. They, they come together all the time, these people, and they vote, you know, and they, they not just elect their representatives, they vote on material subjects. And this is sometimes true. You certainly saw some pictures of a lot of people on, on a place, and they, you know, have the hand, and, and so um, these folkloristic uh, events. But now um, let's look at the federal level. Of course, in Switzerland we have the cantonal level, the communal level, but now just the federal level. And on the other level, levels is not it's not completely different. Um, there in Switzerland now, as a proud direct um, democracy, um, there are um, certain part of the, the statutes that are indeed accepted by the people. Not quite all. This is the first line. Not quite all, just 0.8% that are accepted directly by the people, that were accepted on a vote and not just by the parliament. So this is symbolic, maybe at least symbolic. And there are sometimes arguments that this symbolic um, rituals can also have some, uh, some influence, but, but it's not very much actually. Now, comes the rate of approval, and this gives a whole chart. I distributed the details of that. You have it on the chair. You can take it with you and tell the world how the direct democracy in Switzerland functions. <laughs> it's good to have a bit of water for, for, this, for these difficult calculations. So it's just really a small part, 0.8%. The rate of approval, these 11.35%, this comes, um, this is according to the consent principle, how many people in that vote or in the votes in, in the average um, consented to this um, statute, then not all people went to the vote. So the, the participation in the vote is somewhere, you have that, the details here, 43%. Um, um, of course, there are many that did not accept the, the no voters. So this, this reduces again. The rate of approval is, of course, above 50%. Um, you, in the average, 55%. Um, only Swiss citizens can vote, by the way, but this legislation is, is applicable also for foreigners. Only citizens of full age can vote, but it's also applicable for uh, young people or for those that become older later, even though um, at that time they were not able to uh, vote. And then it's something like, I call it a fading out rate. Um, you know, just this, this, this aspect that um, there are a lot of people, they, they die, 
with the time, and there are newborn um, in this population, but the newborn did not vote for these statutes. They are in force during their lifetime. So did they inherit this obligation? In private law, this is an interesting aspect. Inheritance law is quite developed, but not in public law. Um, so, so that's why it's just 11.35, so this gives that, this um, point, uh, 0 0.09. Then, then comes the indirect democracy. This is the parliamentary system. Um, there, it, it's about 25% of all statutes that come from that body. And now comes a very, very small, um, you know, this 11.35%, no, this, this point zero 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 one three percent. Why is this that small? Um, it's it's um, an idea behind it um, that was mentioned in some of the speeches, right? In in, in the speech before I, I attended in one of these group, and also when we heard something about this ideology of democracy, um, that that it's the fiction that those, those parliament members have a mandate from their um, voters um, so that they are representatives. They are something like a proxy of, of those people. But um, if you try to, 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 to give them a weight, um, uh, what what is representation? Representation is I I give you my my power of attorney. You can go there and vote for me. I can give you instructions. Um, I can also say, oh no no, um, I will go there myself. That this is representation. This is a power of attorney. Um, and now we have the fiction that. Here we have also something like a power of attorney, but that's just not the case. So it's, it's the case in a very, very small extent. Because by the way, I mean, by the way that these people do not listen to your instructions, um, you have to share one representative over there in Bern in Switzerland, or you in Washington, I think it's about the same ratio, with 30,000 other principles, you know. There are 30,000 principles with one representative, with one agent. And this is not representation. This is maybe something like a, a guardianship or a tutorship of, of those um, representatives, but, but it's not representation. And, and therefore, I think when, when you weight that, then it's one thirty thousand. Um, part of it, and this gives this very, very small pic, um, figure. And then comes not the delegated legislation. Actually, there are quite a lot of the most part of all uh, statutes, 74%, that are not um, made by the parliament, but by the executive branch. <coughs> and there, these figures are much, much lower. So in Switzerland, this paradise of direct democracy, <laughs> We have one, but it's true in the extent of 0.09%. So I think this second um, um, principle, this second fundamental law principle, the principle of consent, is not met neither um, by the state. So the state does not pass these tests of law its noble principles such as the rule of law or democracy. Now to look at it really with a realistic eye, these noble principles turn out to be helpless excuses of a criminal gang caught in unlawful actions such as taxation, mandatory regulations, etc. Um, the, the reason why he, it elaborates this principle, this principle of rule of law, of democracy, these are, 
this is because he he makes all these um, uh, invasions, these attacks, these aggressions. Um, in case he would not do so, there would be no need to justify um, its action. But once he does it, he has to have excuses. And once you look precisely at, at these excuses, you, you can see that um, they are not true, just not true. So at that time, then, I became an anarchist. Just by, by, by searching for the, the, the question or trying to understand what law is. Now, out of this state case, some additional um, lessons um, could be learned um, about the law. Law emerges in case of need and disappears not when justice is established but when unlawfulness is eliminated. We, we, we had this concept, um, equality before the law, uh, consent, things like that, and then we asked the question, ah, there is somebody, this state, coming in, let's check these criterions on him. So that was the, 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 the opportunity to, to make this test. Just because of this, because somebody comes in, some aggressor, some trespasser comes in, now we have to, um, to apply these norms on it. One could say, this sounds perhaps a bit, um, a bit strange, law is the absence of unlawfulness. This is the specific negative aspect of law. We, for instance, um, always see also in the questions, what is a property right? right? We discussed that recently. Um, is this a, a mere negative aspect or are there positive aspects as well? But I think on a very fundamental basis, law is negative. It's just, it sounds a bit, a bit awkward. It's the absence of unlawfulness, such as, for instance, the unlawfulness of the state. That was for me an interesting um, um, uh, aspect that it's something negative, it's something that um, gives not the basis to implement some positive idea, but it gives the basis to defend yourself against uh, attacks. Now, the uh, next question is, what then is the force of law? How, how does the law now, as a, as a reaction to unlawfulness, um, um, have effects, results, influences the facts. And I think this aspect of this, this negative um, element of law says that the force of law comes out of the unlawfulness it destroys, or you can say comes out of the action of which it is the reaction. This is um, the force of law. And the consequence is that law does not need to be put into force. Um, it's also a myth that you always hear that law, this is fine, you can define it somehow, but then you need some very strong um, instance that helps to enforce it of course, the state, but this is not true. The force of law comes out of the law. Of course, it's useful to respect the law, but it would be absurd to order it because it's there. The law is there. Or you can say the law is what comes anyway. You cannot escape the law. Law is essentially inescapable. The law is what no one can escape from, not you, not me, not the sun. Actually, it's a, uh, it's a, the rule of law is a term used also by natural sciences. So no one, no one can escape them, not the universe and of course not the state. Or I, I then came to the conclusion 
to my question, what is law? Maybe that will change again, but at least for the time being, I would say law is inescapability. This is the essence of law. And just in passing, by the way, I became an anarchist. <laughs> so that was the longer version of the answer how I came to this conclusion. Um, that was the inescapability. Now I have to add, or I, I'm glad to add also <laughs> something about the subtitle, um, about the inescapability of Mises, of Rothbard, and of Hoppe. Now what the inescapability uh, of Mises is concerned, um, uh, Mises was, for me, for, for these findings, not too important. I, I read them, uh, books of, of, of him, um, before those of Rothbard that were much more um, effectful for me. But um, it, was, it was interesting to read Mises, and namely what this inescapability of law or of certain laws is concerned. Um, that, that was very interesting with, with Mises. For instance, just to give you sp small examples, the market in, and its inescapable law are supreme to any political programs. That's a short quote out of Gemeinwirtschaft. I, I read that first in German, Gemeinwirtschaft, which was later then in English came out as socialism. And then some interesting um, quotes, Mises, the discovery of the inescapable interdependence of market phenomena overthrew the opinion of an ideal state. Interestingly, this quotation comes right after the one you made in your first lecture yesterday morning um, when you, you when what was about the, the other system of an ideal state we have to good to have good princes and you you exemplified that with the two candidates of your last presidential elections <laughs> and then comes sort of the answer that the discovery of the inescapable interdependence, these are kind of laws of market phenomena, overthrew that old, that other traditional um, uh, attitude. This is Mises. And then um, in the course, course of social events, there prevails a regularity of phenomena to which man must adjust his action if he wishes to succeed. So you have to respect these, these laws, these regularities. Um, uh, you, you won't have to give them, to order them. They are there, but it's recommendable to respect them, to use them. Otherwise, you would be, um, you, you can't uh, get through. And then a very interesting um, sentence one must study the laws of human action and social cooperation as the physicist studies the laws of nature. That, that's, I think that's a remarkable sentence. It's maybe not too typical for Mises. In later books, uh, such as maybe, what was that the latest? Um, history and theory, perhaps. He was, I thought, very reluctant to, to follow this, this sentence. But but for me, it was quite consistent to, um, to all these other um, aspects too. And, and, and for me, it was very um, interesting to, to, to read as a lawyer, you know, this kind of law that it's not an imposed law, but that there are regularities that, that happen. They are there. That's, that was, was, sort of inescapability of Mises. And now what the inescapability of Mary Rothbard is concerned, um, when I, I first wrote the small article, article by him, Society Without the State, it's, it's of 1975. It's very small, uh, five or six pages, very precisely written, as always, by Rothbard. And, um, and there, I read things like this. The basic point, however, is that the legal state is not needed 
to arrive at legal principles. Yes, that, that's precisely what, what I thought when I, when I saw that the conflict um, produces its own um, solutions. That, that's precisely the reason why a state is not needed. And of course, when you read more about Rothbard, then you, you find more details, namely also what the law is concerned, and here too, that um, all these legal traditions, they come out of the conflicts of, of court um, decisions. And then what is interesting, derived either from custom or reason. So Rothbard still has some source where he takes it from. Um, he, he, he wouldn't say it comes out of the conflict itself, but uh, from other sources. Custom reason is quite close to the conflict itself, but um, um, in principle there are sources where he takes the answers from. Um, here again, that therefore this idea that the state is needed he says it's as much a myth as that the state is needed to supply postal or police services. And then, of course, these very uh, clear and nice um, sentences, the state, by its very nature, must violate the generally accepted moral rules to which most people adhere. Um, so this is now not anymore that the state is not needed, but that he is illegitimate, that he doesn't meet these tests we looked at before. And then something uh, very close to, to what, what I thought before, um, that it's just a coercive criminal organization. Um, he, he, he said, and which gets away with it by engineering the support of the majority. Uh, by the way, it's never a majority. It's always a very, very small minority, as you see out of my chart. That was the inescapability of Mary Rothbard, and now comes the inescapability of Hans Hoppe. Um, here is that interesting um, link from um, from Rothbard to Hans Hoppe that remarkably and extraordinarily Hans Hoppe has proven me wrong. He has done it. He has deduced. Now we are again at the subject of where does these norms come from. He has reduced an anarcho-Lockean right ethic from self-evident axioms. They do not come anymore by customs or things like that, but out of the conflict in a way. And that, I think, was then very close to my, to my thoughts. Um, if you um, imagine a, a small chart, this is the last one. If you have this sort of fundamental philosophical duality, you have always, you have the facts and you have rationality or you have theory and history, or um, you have the general and the specific. Um, and here now, in our case, you have the facts. This is the conflict. This is the, the occasion to talk about law, the incompatibility. Ultimately, it's always a physical incompatibility, sometimes the threat of it, but ultimately, it's always about and physical incompatibility on the one side and then dealing with a conflict or with incompatibility on the other side. We have this rationality and now um, what Hans Hoppe's principle of argumentation is concerned, I would make that on, on this charge here with an arrow that comes down here that now you link rationality with um, these facts, with your principle of argumentation. You do not get the source from somewhere outside, but you argue about the conflict. This is not abstract rationality, but rationality dealing with this very conflict. Um, the, the quality of the arguments is that there are no, that they do not have contradictions, or only as far as there are no contradictions, 
they are valid. And now what my approach is concerned, I think this fits quite good in this picture, um, but here the arrows goes bottom up. Um, I think that the conflict as a reaction to these actions in the conflict um, creates things, creates um, reactions from the victim, from bystanders, from, from a certain part of society which, which, which then deals with this conflict, which develops procedures, things like that, which develops a whole system of law and of procedure and maybe of courts and of whatever as a natural consequence, as an inescapable consequence of the conflict itself. And within this conflict, do you see my arrow? So part of this reaction, of this complex reaction, is also argumentation is also an argumentation that focuses precisely on the conflict as such. And therefore I think this, this is the world, so to speak, out of which the conflicts are solved. We, whatever the difference is, maybe there are, but what, what, what we certainly agree is that the state is not needed. We do not have to catch some help over there. He is not needed. This is what, what we heard before from Mary Rothbard also. And if you look here, when you apply these arguments, he is illegitimate. Um, Hans Hoppe's approach is rather up there. I could imagine mine is down here. We um, debated that sometimes already, but we became very good friends inescapably. <laughs> Many thanks. This question is a bit speculative. Are you in any way influenced by the writings of Immanuel Kant? By the way? By the writings of Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant. Um, maybe everybody in the West is influenced by Immanuel Kant. Um, but I, I wouldn't say too much. Um, maybe maybe th th there is an a, 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 um, interface, so to speak, a link, I think, to his categorical imperative. And, and this is actually <coughs> the same idea as this kind of equality before the law, you know, or of arguments that are not contradictory. Um, if, if, you, if you find arguments, if you find thoughts, that you can apply in the conflict to both sides uh, without getting in a conflict, then, then I could imagine, yes, it's, it's in, in, that, in, in that tradition, so to speak. Uh, in another way, I, I would say it, at least my part, so this left part, the left is not in the political sense. <laughs> this, this left part um, that comes bottom up this is not Kantian. I, I think Kantian is at least prominently top down, but only prominently. I, I, he, is, he is more differentiated than just to say bot, bottom up or top down. So, in part, yes, and in other parts, no. Another lawyer. Hello. Uh, I wonder if the quote you had from Rothbard about how the uh, the uh, arbitrators or judges would solve a conflict by resort to custom and reason, I'm not so sure he was assuming an outside source in that sense. Uh, he was explaining how the judges make their decision, but they are still making a decision about 
resolving the conflict. Maybe he didn't emphasize that so much, but I, I don't think it's incompatible with, with, uh, with the idea that law does emerge from the, from the, uh, the solution of conflicts over time. Well, maybe, maybe it's about, is it about the, um, the role of argumentation, of reasoning within these reactions out, out of a conflict? Um, I, I think it's, it's a, it's a, um, a, a very important part of how the reactions are out of a conflict. Um, I could imagine in a world without the state, um, next year or so, <laughs> that the legal system is at least, you know, uh, the, the, um, what you see of it, if you look at it, is not fundamentally different. There, there would be kinds of reasoning, there would be bookshelves, there would be um, um, educated people in this matter, there would be procedures, there would be judges, there would be reasonings like that, arbitrators, um, um, and ultimately the only difference is that none of all these players has a monopoly. Or you can put it in another way, um, like um, in or the same way that you can say um, it's not forbidden to kill somebody because it's forbidden in the penal code. It's in the penal code because it's forbidden. The same way you can say all these procedures that people shout around, that they, they, they call for advocates, that they go to some third authority, that the third authority um, takes some colleagues with him and thinks about the case. All this does not happen because it's, it's defined like that in some procedural code or in some law precedents but because it's the way it happens if there is a conflict of homo sapiens members. So has it to do with your question, this answer? Yeah. How are the uh, reactions to you in Switzerland when you talk about your ideas? My, yeah. my class action in Switzerland? Yeah. <laughs> So that would be the next lecture, you know, yeah. uh, and, and you, you want to go to the celebration of, of Hans, but nevertheless, I, I, I can make some remarks very gladly. Um, the idea um, of, I had the idea already that instead of, you know, just uh, make all these theories, but one should do something. This is what Karl Marx also once said. <laughs> Um, one should do something. I, what shall I do? Um, shall I shall I make a, a new party and then to try to get the uh, influence in this this political system? No, certainly not. I do not want to become the member of this the, this this gang organization. Um, and namely, I I came to the conclusion that was what I showed you that it's not a political problem. Of course, it is also a political that it's not only an economic problem, but that it's very um, importantly a legal problem. It's, it's a, and therefore, the consequence would be to file a class action against Swiss Confederation to collect many plaintiffs that file an action against Swiss Confederation not, not demanding the dissolution but um, asking or um, pretending being um, um, befreit, uh, liberated, liberated um, from this mandatory mem membership. Um, th that's, that's the idea. And, and, and I'm beginning to organize something like that. I do not know precisely whether it's really then a hardcore legal case or it's more something like a campaign to to talk about these questions uh, but but we are I'm preparing something like that in any event because it's not um, an action that asks for a dissolution this is important because 
as a, an anarchist, I do not want to um, hinder anybody to become the member of such an organization. If somebody wants to be there, and even if this is 90% of the population, okay, they shall have their state. And they will become happy, perhaps. Uh, perhaps. Um, but the other 10%, they should be free to organize themselves or not to be organized at all. This is the idea of this class action, which is not very much um, developed yet. Uh, it takes time and... Uh, Okay, I hear they are waiting for you to publish in English. Yes, yes, that's, that's, um, I should do that because, yes, German is not that, that, um, broadly uh, read. And, and some, some very small things I did already, and maybe one can, one can uh, translate some, but, but that's, I, I know that, yes, and I'm working on it. And to learn English, of course. Thank you.